what do you make of what we're getting so far from the event? Um, I would just say it's more than what would be expected. Um, you know, we're at least seeing some commentary coming out of the regulators. Um, we're talking, what, four months since there was the market meltdown, uh, the, uh, the introduction of a new chairman to the CSRC. It's going to take a bit of time before real details will come out. So the fact that there are any details at this point, I think that's pretty positive. Can you tell us, I mean, you're, you're based in Shanghai, you're in the Lu Jiajue area. I'm, you know, Peter, can you tell us a bit more about what it's like sentiment on the ground here from the clients and the businesses that you talk to? Is business really coming back to the mainland? Um, in terms of the foreign community, the short answer is no. Um, you know, there's been, um, number one, I would say the sentiment locally, uh, which has been you know, clearly impacted by the ongoing softness in the housing market. Uh, it's much better than it was six months ago, uh, but there has been a consistent, I would say, um, drumbeat of geopolitical stress that has permeated the entire global community in terms of businesses that China is just not a place you want to go, not a place that you want to invest in. And you, you can see this from the level of or the decreased level of senior executives that are traveling. And the Lu Jatsui Forum is a good example. We, you know, we just this morning got the list of individuals that will be participating and there was a very limited number of uh, global executives that will be attending and I think that's just uh, indicative of the, the current state. And perhaps the future state as well Peter do you see that reversing any at any point in time and, and what is the impact then are we going to continue to see weakness in, in FDI? Yeah, I mean, there needs to be, at least in my opinion, uh, a sentiment shift globally. And I suspect that we will see this. Look, I've been in China for 30 years. For me, this is the fourth cycle, if you will. You know, whether it was Asian financial crisis, SARS, the global financial crisis, there are ebbs and flows. I view this as just being one of those cycles. Uh, the primary difference, though, between those periods and today, again, are headline or headline risks. We're aware of clients, quite frankly, that have a no China travel policy. And look, I'm all for risk management. I believe that's a, a great mm -hmm. element for all organizations. But this is borderline, I would say, hysteria. Uh, it, will, it will trend downwards. Uh, it's just a matter of when, perhaps later this year or sometime in 2025. And I guess maybe it, not just the housing market, I'm guessing, you know, we need this 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 Chinese stock market to actually stabilize or at least get back to on some sort of positive trend. I'm wondering what you're hearing from obviously the CSRC and Wu Ching. He's he's come to this job quite aggressively, I believe. Everything from cracking down from quant trading, scrutiny over the listing of firms uh, on on their on their benchmarks and the like. I'm just wondering, um, you know, what other market capital market reforms, you know, can he do or should he do to really turn around this market? Well, I, th I think there are two um, that are front and center at the moment, um, and quite frankly, not really being covered. Uh, there is the speculated, although I think it's more than speculation, of a, um, a merger between Haitong Securities and Guotai Drenan Securities. And if there's one thing that China needs to do, at least from my perspective, is a reduction in overall capacity. Um, among the securities broker dealers uh, throughout, I think there's something still mm -hmm. like over you know, nearly a hundred. And if they were to move forward with such a significant merger between these two very large brokers here in Shanghai, you'd probably see this continue into Shenzhen and Beijing with some of the larger brokers there. The second, I think, focus that we're we're very closely monitoring is the development of the ETF market. Quite oddly. And, you know, mm -hmm. one of the issues that China has had to really address is the, the, the sheer level of retail participation and the whipsawing that that can cause in share prices and indice levels, you know, over the last 15 years, you know, introducing uh, a more uh, structured, institutionally led ETF business, I think, is pretty high up on the CSRC's uh, priority list. Peter, as well, we're getting some headlines that are dropping from the PBOC governor, 
Japan as well, just talking about what we're getting for, for sovereign bond sales and they're looking at ways so they can possibly yep. optimise it. But, but broadly speaking, you've seen investors that really can't get enough of Chinese bonds and agitating for some sort of policy changes. Do you see that coming and do you see any sort of changes on the fiscal front as well? Oh, that's a that's a great question because I have been very um, strong when talking with others that it needs to be recognized that Keynes is dead in China, and what I mean by that is what has it been the past year or so where you'll have people on that are always talking about the need for China to have this this bazooka of fiscal stimulus. You know, China did that in 2008 and 9, and it led to some pretty disastrous long-term effects. They don't want to do that again. And while, you know, I'll have people push back and say, well, what about this trillion renminbi special purpose bond? Yes, that was issued and, and announced back in March, but it was more about trying to put a floor under sentiment. Because what have we seen since then is this trickling out of, you know, 30, 40, 50 billion per week of issuance that's going to take six months. Um, China simply does not want to blow out its fiscal balance sheet like we have seen in places such as the United States or in Japan. And they're trying, I think, mm. to learn those lessons. And it's not like demand is an issue. You know, we've seen actually PBOC coming out just this past week trying to temper the enthusiasm by local investors that are clamoring for yield because there's no other option. Uh, cash is pretty yeah. low. Equities are volatile and housing continues to be weak. So I suspect that this is going to be a, 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 a fronted war that the PBOC will continue to, to be fighting for the next several months. So, so if, if the economists are overestimating the amount of fiscal stimulus, I mean, what, what is still needed on the stimulus front to really, you know, help reflate this, this economy once again? I mean, everyone's banking on fiscal. If it's not that, what else could it be? Um, it, it's a great question because, you know, the, the typical answer is, uh, is going to be, you know, driving consumer sentiment higher, getting more people to be able to spend, uh, which, is, which is clearly a struggle. Uh, there's also issues such as restructuring the economy, um, which we're seeing sort of play out and we'll see what comes out, let's say, in the third plenum next month. Um, but the only thing I can state with relative certainty is that going back to the typical Keynesian playbook of just firing money at the problem, the Chinese are very, very astute and are aware that that, you know, it's a sugar high, but it's not going to solve any problems. And especially things like direct consumer stimulus, you know, I've always found that laughable because what are the Chinese going to do with it? They're just going to park it in the bank. They're not going to spend it. So this is where the structural element of reforms is really required. Um, and it's more about that third plenum and what may or may not come out that yeah. will address it. But Yvonne, right now, it's, it's really up in the air, with the exception of knowing that Keynes is in fact dead in China.